joining us by way of the video broadcast. Thank you for joining us today at Spirit of Life Church for the preaching of God's Word. Uh, we dive straight into it this morning. Uh, we're in our sermon series, I believe. Can I just ask for that to be brought a little bit forward, please? My eyes are open. We're in our sermon series, I believe, and uh, we're in chapter 10. Today we continue our exposition of the gospel according to John, and we're going to look at chapter 10. Last week we preached and taught from chapter 9 about the man born blind. Now as we look into chapter 10 today, on this is the Lord's Day, and on the next Lord's Day, next week, I want you to see that chapter 10 is not a new discourse. A, it's not a new teaching in the sense that Jesus has picked up on a new topic. But it's actually a continuation of chapter 9. And we're going to see that this morning. I'm going to explain that to you as we journey this morning. So let's pick up our reading in John chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 18. Are you there? <clears throat> Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold but by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the thing which he spoke to them. So let's look at verse 7. Then Jesus said in verse 7, he said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, <clears throat> I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. <clears throat> I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. But a hireling, he who, has not, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down, lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep which I are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will, and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I received from my Father. We'll stop at verse 18. So the title of my sermon today is The Shepherd of the Sheep. The Shepherd of the Sheep, Part 1. Uh, and uh, I'm going to teach today rather than preach. And uh, hopefully we will be encouraged and sharpened and strengthened by it. So I am... The I Am's we're going to come across in chapter nine, uh, sorry, chapter 10. And the title of this morning is The Shepherd of the Sheep, Part 1. Now in chapter 9, the blind man was healed. Do you remember we covered that? The blind man was healed by Jesus, uh, but his healing was not accepted by the Pharisees. And what did they do? They threw him out of the synagogue. Do you remember that? Let's pick up that story in um, chapter 9. I'm going to look at verse 35. Let's look at verse 35 
of chapter 9, very quickly. Verse 35 of chapter 9. Then Jesus heard that they had cast him out, him being the blind man. What did they do? They cast him out of the synagogue. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He, s- he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I want to stop right there. So we find that the Pharisees did not accept the healing of the man. And what did they do? They threw him out of the synagogue. But I want you to look at um, the difference between Jesus' actions and the Pharisees' actions. The Pharisees threw him out, but what did Jesus do? Look at verse, um, what verse is that? Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had what? Found him. What does it say? He found him. Jesus went out and found the man. And when Jesus had fully revealed himself to the man and received him as his own. And this is totally opposite. Jesus declares here the difference in chapter 10 now. Jesus declares the difference between himself and the Pharisees. Can you see the difference? Jesus proved that he's the shepherd of the sheep. And in verse 11 of chapter 10, he declares this amazing I am, which is I am the good shepherd. Now the Bible says, refers to Jesus by many titles, and I'm sure um, you are familiar with some of them, and there are almost 67 of those titles in the entire Bible. You will come across them, you may know them already. For example, it's called the, Jesus is called the Amen. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. I'm not going to go through the entire 67. It's called the Alpha and the Omega. It's called the Advocate. It's called the Author and Perfecter of the Faith, and that's just all the titles beginning with A. If you go all the way down the alphabetical titles, you get to the the bottom bit, which is the way, the truth, and the life. Or the way. Jesus is the way. So at at, at the top, Jesus is the amen. At the bottom of the alphabetical list, Jesus is the way. So there are almost 67 titles, but the one that is most endearing, I believe, the one that is most endearing for the church is found in John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. That's endearing. It gets to our hearts. And John 10 gives us the most detailed exposure to the ministry of the Good Shepherd and the distinctive marks of the Good Shepherd. And today I will touch on a few of those marks and we'll continue the rest on the next Lord's Day. So, we find that there's a sharp contrast between the false shepherds and the Good Shepherd. So we're we're teaching today. We're not preaching, we're teaching. This is... To bring illumination and understanding. So there's a sharp difference between the false shepherds and the good shepherd. Jesus declares himself as the good shepherd compared to the Pharisees who were, let's say for example, let's put it in these inverted commas, bad shepherds. The opposite of good was bad. And why were they bad? Because they were self-serving shepherds. They were self-appointed shepherds. They were shepherds who were hooked to the carnal system of this world. These shepherds had the title of shepherd, but their hearts were far from taking care of the flock. And this is evidenced, as you've seen in the last few minutes in chapter 9, it's evidenced by the incident of the blind man in chapter 9 where they throw him out, but Jesus goes looking for this man. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So when Jesus arrived on the scene in his physical form, were there leaders in Israel? Yes. Were there shepherds in Israel? Yes. But although they were shepherds in Israel, the people were still scattered. The people were still like a people without a shepherd. Can you see that? So the good shepherd is the one whose life is dedicated to the care of the flock 
And Jesus makes that point clear by painting this picture for us in John chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 6. Let's read that again. John chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 6. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Verse 5. Yet they will, bring, yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Let's put this picture Verse 1 to verse 6, let's put this picture into a cultural context. For many of us living in Bristol today, we live in a city, we have no idea what a sheepfold is. In many of the ancient towns and villages of the land of Palestine, out on the hills there were many wild beasts. So when the shepherds took their flocks out into the fields and in the pastures and on the sides of the hills, they had to protect the sheep. And then, of course, at night when the wild beasts were roaming as freely as ever, it was very helpful for the shepherds to protect their sheep. And how did they do that? They would usually uh, build a sheepfold and then would bring their flocks into the sheepfold. Now, this sheepfold was one that was occupied not by just one shepherd, but by many shepherds. So three, four, five, six shepherds with their, with their flocks would bring all of their sheep together at night into this sheepfold in this village or in the city. Are you following me so far? So, this, so the shepherds would come with their flock and they would approach the gate and there would be a gatekeeper or a doorkeeper. And that doorkeeper or gatekeeper would remained there as a guard throughout the night to guard all the sheep in his care. Around this particular enclosure, this sheepfold, there was a high fence where the sheep could not climb out and these wild animals could not come in to devour the sheep. Then in the morning time, when the shepherds were to take their flocks out into the pastures, they would come to the sheepfold and the doorkeeper would allow them to come in to the sheepfold. Are you with me right now? Can you imagine that? And then the sheep, the shepherds would, would call their sheep out. The shepherds would stand there and they would call their sheep out and they would do that vocally. I'm not going to try and imitate what it means to call sheep out from other sheep, but they would call them vocally. You know, vocally. And, and, and each one had a particular call. Each shepherd had a particular call. And the sheep knew the call of the shepherd. And the sheep then would now themselves separate themselves from the other sheep and they would follow after the shepherd. How wonderful that is. God's creation is amazing. The shepherd would call his sheep and he would lead them off and that's the picture we have of the sheepfold. Can you imagine that? Now with that image in our minds, what is Jesus trying to teach us here? Because in verse, in verse 6 it tells us that Jesus used this illustration. What is this illustration trying to tell us? What is Jesus teaching us here? Who is the shepherd? Who is the door? Who are the thieves and the robbers? Who is the sheepfold? Well, it's clear. As we read in John 10, it's clear as we read in John 10, as we go on to read like in verse 11, that Jesus is the shepherd, is the good shepherd, and Jesus is also the door. And we're going to cover that in the next few minutes. The thieves and the robbers are the self-appointed leaders of Israel who are really servants and workers of the devil as we've discussed, as we've discussed and discovered in John chapter 8. Do you remember when Jesus said to these Pharisees that you are really are, are like your father? And who was their father? The devil, Satan. He said your nature is like your father. And so these men were really false shepherds who were worshipping the devil, serving the purposes of the devil. So rather than caring for the flock, caring for the sheep, they were devouring the flock and scattering and exploiting the sheep for their own gain, 
for their own benefit. So these were the false shepherds. So who's the sheepfold? So you understand that, 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 uh, that Jesus is the, the good shepherd and the door. And we're going to come across that in the next few minutes. Why he's also called the door. We know that the thieves and the robbers are the self-appointed leaders. So who's the sheepfold then? Well, the sheepfold, some have ventured to say, the sheepfold is the church. And you might think that's a good answer, that the sheepfold is the church. Why not? It's the church. But there's a problem with that. Let me, allow me to explain. If Jesus is the shepherd, and if the sheepfold is the church, then why would Jesus call the sheep out of the church? Can you see my train of thought right now? Also, robbers and thieves can never break into the true church to steal sheep. Never happen. So the sheepfold can't be the church. Some might say, well, the sheepfold is heaven. And that sounds really good. Why not? Sheepfold is heaven. All the sheep are in this fold and the sheepfold is heaven. But there's a problem with that. If Jesus is the shepherd and if the sheepfold is heaven, then why would Jesus call again his sheep out of heaven? Are you with me right now? Are you following me right now? Furthermore, I'm sure heaven is not such an insecure place where robbers and thieves can climb in and steal sheep. So we know it's not the church. We know the sheepfold is not the church. We know it's not heaven. So what is the sheepfold? The sheepfold is Israel. Here in chapter 10, verse 1 to 6, the sheepfold is Israel. Allow me to explain a little further. Well, I believe it's Israel. Look with me at Ezekiel chapter 20. It's coming up on your screen right now. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37. Follow with me as I read. Verse 33. Am I right? Nope. 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 That's the one. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 to 37, says this. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with, a, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. He's talking about Israel. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. And with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples there. And I will plead my case with you face to face. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says the Lord your God. And then the last part of it says, I will make you pass under the rod. And I will bring you in the bond. Bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will make you do what? I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you, I will pick you out of the wilderness. I will take you from the places that you were scattered. I will bring you and I will make you pass under the rod. Keep that in mind. It's gonna, they're going to pass under the rod. Verse 37 again gives us the image of the shepherd and the sheep. And what I didn't tell you in, that, in creating that image in your mind, what I didn't tell you was that actually when the when the shepherds brought their sheep to the sheepfold at night. The shepherd would put his rod, his staff, across the entrance, low enough that the sheep could not go through, but also high enough that the sheep could not climb over. And so he would put his staff across, his rod across the entrance, and he would check each sheep as it passed through. He would make sure that it was not wounded, he'd make sure it was not injured, and he'd make sure that that was actually his sheep that was going into the fold. And here God is telling us, and here we have a picture of the future time when the good shepherd would gather Israel into Israel. Would gather Israel into Israel, which is his sheepfold. And then, and then call Israel out of Israel. <laughs> Are you with me right now? You look like you lost a little bit. But you want me to explain that a little further? He will call Israel from the wilderness, from their scattered places, into Israel, which is the sheepfold. And out of Israel, the sheepfold, he will call Israel into his mess messianic kingdom. He will save Israel. Some of God's elect are in that sheepfold, are in Israel. And Jesus is the Messiah, 
shepherd, the shepherd Messiah who comes to lead them out of Judaism into a relationship with God the Father through him. And unlike the false prophets, the false shepherds who were trying to get, in the, get into the sheepfold by climbing over the fence, climbing over the walls, Jesus, Jesus calls out to his sheep and they come to him because they hear his voice. And we'll be talking more about that, hearing his voice on the next Lord's Day. So my conclusion here is that the sheepfold is Israel. And Jesus is the good shepherd, not exploiting and devouring Israel, but calling them out to, into his messianic kingdom. Now that we're clear on what these images in John 10 are, we can continue. Let's continue a little further. Uh, we, we have identified Jesus as, as the good shepherd, and we see that his ministry is greatly contrasted, greatly contrasted to the earthly, carnal-minded shepherds whose only purpose is to serve themselves. So what we have is Jesus was the good shepherd and all other shepherds are false. Now, false shepherds are nothing new to Jesus. In fact, these false shepherds were the latest in a long line of false shepherds in Israel. Let's go back to our Isaiah scripture. So here's Jesus on the scene. This is nothing new for him. Isaiah 56 verse 10 to 11 says this, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. <laughs> they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. They, and they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his own gain. From his own territory. Sharp words. Hard words. There are many other verses in the Old Testament that make mention of, of these false shepherds. We've got no time to go into them. Scripture is specific about what they do. But scripture is also specific that their judgment cannot be escaped. They cannot escape the judgment that is due to them. For example, in Jeremiah, tell me when I'm there. Am I there? Jeremiah 23 verse 1 to 2 says this. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Woe to them. Woe to them, says the Lord. Therefore thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. As you've done, I will do. I will attend to you. There's coming a day when you'll be judged for what you've done. One of the key truths, many of you know my story, but one of the key truths that broke me free from the Pentecostal charismatic word of faith belief that I had was God's righteous judgment on me for being the shepherd I was. The conviction that what I was teaching and the way I was leading was false and, 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 and that God would judge me for that. That conviction was laid heavily upon my heart. And there were, there were times when folks would walk out of our church. We'd, we never struggled for attendance-wise. And folks would run out of our church and, and speak about how great the service was. Oh, that was great, man of God. And all these things were said. But in my own heart, I knew, I knew, I knew that what the, the food that I was feeding and the care that I was extending was not according to the Word of God. And it took God's Spirit to convict me heavily of that. And that's what brought, uh, brought my deliverance from that belief and from that faith system. Today we are living in a world where there are many, like I called myself, a, a, a prophet of God and a true shepherd of God. There are many who call themselves prophets and posing as true shepherds, but really they're manipulating, they're deceiving, only to feed themselves rather than feed the flock. In the New Testament, Jesus warns us about this. Look at Matthew, Matthew 7, verse 15. It's on the screen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. 
You see, we, we could have easily done this morning. I could have come. What in, in, in the old church, we would have come to you and said to you, um, if you sow a seed, <laughs> you'll get a new job. See, we, had, we have a need today. We had a need. We would have said to you, if you sow the seed, God will provide a miracle for you. God will, you know, there, there's a turnaround on its way for you. We would have easily done that. That's false. That's leading you incorrectly. And so there are many people who are still doing things like that. And Jesus says to them, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. We're just eating away at your money. Just eating away at who you are. Eating away at your Christianity. Paul warns the elders of the Ephesians, Ephesian church in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. For this is what he says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Hmm. Can you imagine how that must have grieved Paul? So here we have a picture of the false shepherds, who are the robbers and the thieves, who want nothing more than to devour the flock, to abuse the flock, to exploit them. But Jesus, on the other hand, is in total contrast to that. He seeks not to destroy, but to build and to care, to nurture and grow the flock. Shall we look a little further at this? I've got some time. As I, before I continue, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 34. I want you to turn with me to Ezekiel 34. It's not on the screen because it's an entire, almost an entire chapter. So I want you to go to Ezekiel 34. And we'll read this. It's a good setting to understand what Jesus is talking about in John 10. This is God speaking through Ezekiel concerning false shepherds. Are you there? Ezekiel 34 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughtered the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord, surely because my flock became prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the sheep fed themselves and did not feed but my sorry but my shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock therefore O shepherds hear the word of the Lord thus says the Lord your God behold I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more for I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. Wow. I will look at verse number. Look at verse 9. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, your God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. Now look at the true shepherd. Look at the true shepherd in verse 11. For thus says the Lord your God, Indeed, I, will, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them 
to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on high mountains of Israel. And they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. And then we, he goes on to describe it. And then he, further on, there's a further judgment about who the sheep should be. But that's not a message for today. So we find there's a picture here of the, of the, the, the true shepherds and the false shepherds. And so Jesus presents himself, he declares himself as the good shepherd in contrast to the false shepherds who are leading Israel. Let's press on a little bit. Look at verse 7 to 10 of John 10 again. Let's go to John 10, look at verse 7 to 10. And Jesus said to them again, why is he saying this to them again? Because they didn't understand his illustration. So he's coming out again, verily, verily, truly, truly. He's making it stronger, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the door. This is the third of the I am declarations. Do you remember what is the first one? I'm the bread of life. What is the second one? I'm the light of the world. We get to the third one. I'm the door. What's the fourth one? I'm the good shepherd. And so we get to the third one and he says, I am the door. He declares himself as the door. But this can be confusing. One minute is the shepherd, the next minute is the door. What's going on here? Hmm. Can be quite confusing, but let's, let's look at it. As we look at verse 7 to 10, Jesus now changes the illustration slightly. He changes the metaphor slightly. He adds to his title now. And he adds it to his title of, the shepherd, now he adds and he says, I'm the door. He doesn't take away the title of shepherd, but adds to it by saying, I am the door. And in verse 1 to verse 5, we gave an illustration, or I gave you a picture of what the sheepfold is. And remember I told you that in that sheepfold, there was a gatekeeper or a doorkeeper. In some commentaries, it's called a porter. Somebody who was hired to stay at the gate to protect the sheep at night. But here in verse 7 to 10, the image is of the shepherd on the hillside making his own sheepfold. You remember I said in from verse 1 to verse 6 that the sheepfold there was occupied by many shepherds. You remember that? But here Jesus changes slightly in verse 7 to 10. This sheepfold now is the one that is made by one shepherd. So the shepherd would go out into the field and found that it was late at night. He couldn't you know, travel to a village to, to, to take his sheep together with all the other sheep. So he would make a sheepfold in the wilderness to protect his sheep. But at the entrance, there was no gate. Neither was there a gatekeeper. But the shepherd himself would sleep at the entrance of the gate or the entrance of the sheepfold to protect his flock. Can you see that? Is that okay for you to see in that picture? So this time, this time the sheepfold is not Israel, but the place of God's blessing. And the only way to get into that blessing is through the door. No one can enter or leave except through that entrance. And who was at that entrance? 
It's the shepherd. And who is the shepherd? It's Jesus Christ. And that's why he says he's the door. Nobody can enter. He says, I'm, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody can have a relationship with God the Father except through me. You can never live in that blessed state, that state of security, that state of protection where you are protected by the, like the sheep are protected by the walls of the sheepfold. You can never be spiritually protected by God unless you pass through the entrance who is Jesus Christ, the door who is Jesus Christ. The renowned magician and escape artist, not uh, Dynamo, but Houdini. Some of our kids may not know who that is, but some of the older folks might know who Houdini is. Houdini could get out of anything. Handcuffs, straitjacket, any prison cell, any box you put him in, he could get out of it. In fact, he could release himself from just almost any enclosure within one minute. Only once did he fail. Just once did he fail. Well, maybe twice because he died, didn't he? The second time he couldn't escape. So let's go back to say the first time he failed. Arriving at a small town in England, he agreed to exhibit his great es escaping ability. So they put him into a local jail. The cell door was so ordinary that Houdini looked at it and he almost laughed, said, this is not a problem. I can escape from it easily. When the signal was given, the door was closed. Houdini inside the cell, at frantic speed, tried to unlock the door to get himself out. To his great surprise, he was unable to pick the lock. Frantically, he tried every device he knew, but nothing happened. For two more hours, normally within one minute he's out, for two more hours he was still working feverishly to get himself out. Finally, completely exhausted, he fell against the door and lamented his defeat. Immediately the door sprung open. His, frust his frustration had been due to the fact that the door had not been locked at all. Imagine that. How frequently, by similar deception, Satan has deluded sinners who are seeking to find a way to open the door of salvation by working. They cry. They fret, they pray, trying in every possible way to bring release for their captive souls. Yet, yet, when they fail, and after their exhaustion from all their efforts, rest against the door who is Jesus Christ. They find that the door is opened for them. The way is open for them for immediate release from their bondage. Immediate release from their desperate situation. How marvelous this is as we consider that picture. How marvelous this is. Our Lord describes himself, how the Lord describes himself not in the loftiest of terms, but in the most simplest of terms, earthly terms. He, he could have chosen, he says, I am something. I am the door, I'm the, I'm the good shepherd. He could have chosen anything. He could have said, I am a golden door. And he, he, he chooses not even, he says, I'm a, I'm a door. <laughs> he doesn't just say, I'm a golden door. He doesn't say, I'm a royal door. He says, I'm a door. <laughs> We know, we, we, we who know him know that he's not just a door, but he's the door. He's the only entrance to the Father. He's the only way, the truth and the life. He's the only way a sinner can be saved. And today, as we leave, today as we leave this building, we will push a door open to leave. We will get to another door and we step forward, it'll open and we'll step out. We'll get to our cars, click a button and the, the, the lock will unlock and we reach over and we pull it and the door will open and we'll step into our cars. We'll get home, we'll put the key in the door, we'll turn it, we'll turn the latch, a door will open. We go into another room, a door will open. On our way out, we will, we will see doors all through this day. And I pray that every door you open today, every doorway you go through today, that you will know in your heart and you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the door. And the only way that you are in the blessed place that you are in is because He is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 
As we get to verse 8, let's look at verse 8 of chapter 10. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. All who ever came before Jesus are thieves and robbers. Think about that for a moment. All who ever came before Jesus are thieves and robbers. Is Jesus saying that Moses was a thief? Joshua was a thief? Ezekiel was a thief? Isaiah was a thief? Jeremiah was a thief? Daniel was a thief? No, he's not saying that. What he is saying is that all the shepherds and kings and priests who were corrupt, they were thieves. They were robbers. They were devouring the flock rather than caring for the flock. They were false prophets, false messengers, false shepherds, false messiahs. But there's an interesting thing there. There's an interesting thing there. Listen to what it says in verse 8. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Underline that. Underline, the sheep did not hear them. Isn't that interesting? The sheep did not hear them. There's a lesson right there for us. In our present world, in our present day, in the 21st century Christianity, in our world today, we are faced by false prophets, false teachers, and false shepherds who are leading people astray. But the true sheep, the real flock of God, will never be led astray. Why? Because they know the voice of not of the pastor who leads, but they know the voice of the good shepherd, the true shepherd, who is Jesus Christ. Here's a question. Thanks for telling me that, pastor. How do I know that God is talking to me? I've never heard his voice. How do I know God is telling me to do something when I've never heard his voice? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Here's the answer. <laughs> Steve Lawson, one of the well-grounded reformed theologians of our time recently preached and he said this <laughs> if you want to hear God speak read your Bible aloud if you want to hear God speak read your Bible aloud if you want to hear God speak don't go looking for a Pentecostal revival if you want to hear God speak don't go looking for a charismatic conference if you want to hear God speak don't go looking for some so-called man of God open your Bible and read it aloud and you will hear God speak why? Because the word of God is God and God is his word. It's as simple as that. The voice of God is the word of God. And when you hear people's people saying things that are not in the word of God, then those are false shepherds, false prophets, false teachers. And we do not pay heed to them because, we, because they do not conform to the word of God. They do not conform to what the Bible says. And so we know the true church knows the voice of God. How do they know the voice of God? Because they know the word of God. The true church is not led away by false teachings and false prophets because they know the voice of God. They know the voice of their shepherd and the voice of their shepherd is the word of God. Let's look at the next verse. Jesus comes back, comes back to him being the door. But this time he adds a promise. Look, look, at, look, at, verse, look at verse 11 of chapter 10. Sorry, verse 9. It says, I am the door, and if anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Uh -huh. Saved from what? Saved from sin and saved from hell. Underline the word anyone. I'm particularly overjoyed by that. The word anyone. Anyone can enter in. What a marvelous thing that is. That anyone, any man, no matter his educational qualification, no matter his social standing, no matter his financial standing, no matter who you are, can enter in. Anyone. The prostitute can enter in. The college professor can enter in. Anyone can enter in. What a marvelous thing that is. But do people enter in? Would do you enter in? You know, doors are meant not to be admired from a distance. Eh? Doors are there for a purpose. They let you in. We don't stand at a distance and say, oh, what a marvelous door we have, and stay outside. I love going up to where Brother Adrian lives on that side of the city because you get these houses with all these different colored doors, red and green and blue. Where I live, they're all white. 
But you go up and then they're green, red. As you drive through that, you can see the whole, and they look nice. You know, they match certain houses. Some of them don't look nice, but some of them do. They match the house and gives you a nice, colorful look. And imagine you go, imagine the guy walks up to his house and says, what a lovely door this is, but I'll stay outside today. And that's how it is with people. They say, what a lovely door that is, but they don't enter in through it. How does it apply to us today? There are people who listen to sermons, who listen to sermons and say, oh, that sermon is rich. It's wonderful, Pastor. That's a great sermon. But they don't believe the one who the sermon is about. There are many who say, that's a great sermon. Oh, well done. But they don't accept who the sermon is about. Jesus is the door. We don't just stand there and say, what a great door that is. No, we enter in. That's what the door is for. So those who are saved, and let's, let's just go on and look more at what this means. Look at verse 9. Again. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Go in and out. What does it mean? Those who are saved will be able to go in and out. And going in and out does not mean going in and out of salvation or going in and out of Christianity. It doesn't mean I'm going to go into Christ today. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go into Christ. I'm going to be a Christian. And then I'm going to go out into the world. I'm going to be a heathen. No, that's not what it means. Going in and out of here is very simply this. The person enters through the door. A sinner enters through the door, finds Christ, is united to God in a glorious, wonderful relationship. And then that person has this great liberty. Liberty in God to come before Him, to come to Him, to come in and to worship in a door and to pray and to have fellowship with God, and then to go out, meaning what? To go out into the world and tell the world of the great fellowship he has just had. That's what it means. This morning we have come in. This morning we have proved the scripture correct. We have come in. How have we come in? We've come together as a church, and together we've come into God in the singing of songs, in worship, and in prayer. And then today we will go out and tell people who we sung about, and who we prayed to and who we worship, and who we have hope and faith and trust in. That's what that means. Now as we come to the end, as we come to the conclusion today of this Lord's Day sermon, I want to focus on verse 10 just to bring clarity to what it means. It says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, how many of you here today have heard people say, say to you that when you become a Christian, that you will have life and have it more abundantly, that you would have excess, that God will give you overflow, and God will bless you over and above what everybody else has? I have. I preach that. We had our church live on that principle before. But that's not what that scripture means. In contrast to the thieves and robbers who take life, Jesus is the good shepherd who gives life, and life in abundance. Now, we must be careful, like I said, how we interpret these words, abundant life. There are people, there are churches today, especially those who are charismatics, word of faith people. When I say word of faith, I mean those who belong to, if you don't know who word of faith is, word of faith is T.D. Uh, Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, uh, Mike Murdoch, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen. Those guys belong to what is called the word of faith movement. They are the name it and claim it people. They're the people who tell you you, you, you can't be sick. God doesn't want you to be sick. God wants you to be rich. And they use this kind of scriptures because here when you are saved, they say, well, Jesus tells you that if you come to him, you will have life and you will have it abundantly. And then they tell you, well, you can have more than one car. You can have more than one house. You should have more than one suit. You should have more jewelry. You should have more. And you should have more. And you should have more. Why? Why should you have more? Because Jesus said, those who come to him will have life and have it more abundantly. But that's a gross misunderstanding and a misrepresentation and an exploitation of the scripture. I did it for many years. I know I'm talking from one who did it for years. It's an exploitation of that scripture. Nowhere does Jesus tell us anywhere that we're going to be rich when we become Christians. Nowhere does he tell us that. Nowhere in the Bible does he tell us that. In fact, he promises the opposite. He says people are going to Shout at you and try and kill you. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be locked up. 
ostracized, criticized, persecuted. There are altar calls made on a Sunday where people are promised, if you come to Jesus, you'll have an abundant life. If you come to Jesus, everything's going to be fine. God will take care of all your needs. Are you struggling right now? Won't you come to him? God will give you everything you want. Are you poor right now? Won't you come to him? God will give you everything you want. Listen, if that's the case, let me tell you right now. How many people here today, really, if you go into the world and tell people, you know what, I've got a way where you can get rich, please, they'll flock in their hundreds. Who doesn't want to have a little bit more money? I mean, you could do a little bit more with money. If you had a bit more, you could do a bit more. And there's always something to do. And so who wouldn't want a bit more money? And so people join Christ, you're united think they're united with Christ because they think Christ is going to make their life better by giving them more stuff, more money. And so people, well, that's a good deal. He's just said to me that if I became a Christian, I'll have abundance. Hey, no problem. Sign me up. Sign me up. And so the, the, the camera pans across the auditorium like we used to do in our old church. You pan across the auditorium and you see the number of people running to the altar. Oh, this must be a real man of God. Because see, the people who came, no, he just exploited the scripture and caused people to believe something that's not true. And so we find that abundance here, abundance is a spiritual abundance and not a material abundance. Ask Paul. He knows all about this. One day we will meet Paul and we will have lengthy conversations with Paul. And Paul will tell us, hey, remember how I told you? I didn't have a coat. I had to tell somebody, can you send me a coat? And so we find abundance is a spiritual abundance, not a material abundance. God is, God is not so concerned. I'm going to say this responsibly, not loosely. God is not so responsible. God is not so concerned about your tomorrow. Do you know why? Because he's already set in place how to take care of you tomorrow. For, for, for God, your tomorrow is not a problem. Because Matthew 6, 25 to 32, Philippians 4, 19 tells us how God takes care of our tomorrow. Whether one has physical blessings or not, whether one has wealth or one is poor, neither is a sure indication of our standing with God. Consider Solomon who had all the wealth of the world, but he considered those things nothing. On the other hand, we have... Paul, who had nothing but was content, he tells Timothy even, be content with what you have. So wealth or lack of it is not a sure sign of our standing with God. So abundance here is not more cars, not more money, not more clothes, not more material things, but spiritual abundance. And the word abundance in, from the Greek means this exceedingly, very highly, beyond measure, more superfluous, a, a quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than, one what, than, one, than, than what one would expect or anticipate. What is that considerably more? What is that abundance? It is our spiritual life and not material things. Amen. Shall we stand to our feet?